ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೋ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿ ನಾವಧಿ ತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾ ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತೆ ಶಾಂತೆ ಶಾಂತಿ ಸಮಸ್ತ ಜನ ಕಲ್ಯಾಣ ನಿರತ ಕರುಣಾಮಯ ನಮಿ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ದೇವ ಸದ್ಗುರು ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ವಿದ್ವರ ನಮ ಶ್ರೀ ಶಂಕರಾನಂದ ಗುರು ಪಾದಾಂಬುಜನ್ಮನೆ ಸವಿಲಾಸ ಮಹಾಮೋಹ ಗ್ರಾಹ ಗ್ರಾಸೈಕ ಕರ್ಮಣಿ ಓಕೆ ಲೆಟ್ಸ್ ಎಸ್ ರೀಡ್ ನೌ ವಿಲ್ ರೀಡ್ ವರ್ಸಸ್ ನೈಂಟಿ ಸೆವೆನ್ ನೈಂಟಿ ಏಟ್ ನೈಂಟಿ ನೈನ್ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಾಂಡಲೋಕದೇಹು ಸದ್ವಸ್ತು ಪೃಥಕೃತೆ ಅಸಂತೋಂಡಾದಯೋ ಭಾಂತು ತದ್ಭಾನೇಪೀಹ ಕಾಕ್ಷತಿ ಭೂತ ಭೌತಿಕ ಮಾಯಾಸತ್ವೇತ್ಯಂತವಾಸಿ ಸದ್ವಸ್ತ್ವೈತಮಿತ್ಯಷ ತೀರ್ವಿಪರ್ಯೇತಿ ನ ಕ್ವಚಿತ್ ಸದ್ವೈತಾತ್ಪೃಥಗ್ಭೂತೆ ದ್ವೈತೆ ಭೂಮ್ಯಾದಿ ರೂಪಿಣಿ ತದ ತದರ್ಥಕ್ರಿಯಾಲೋಕೆ ಯಥಾದೃಷ್ಟ ತಥೈವ ಸಾ ಸೊ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ವಿದ್ಯಾರಣ್ಯಜಿ ಇಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಬ್ಯೂಟಿಫುಲಿ ನಾವು ಇನ್ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಪ್ರಾಸೆಸ್ ರೈಟ್ ಸೊ ದ ಹೋಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ Panchadashi chapter 2, what was he trying to do? Sad eva somya idam agra asit. Ekam eva adhitiya. Sat alone us. Right? Before this whole world came into being, sat alone was. And what was that sat? One non-dual without a second. One without a second. One alone without a second. <clears throat> and this sat we're saying was because we have to put a verb there if you remember there was a whole talk about it but the basic truth is that existence alone is right sat alone is and how he went through this process is he went through maya space air fire water and finally he came to earth and the brahmanda and what he says is look at all of these things and when you remove existence from it does it exist and the answer is no it ceases to exist therefore if we remove existence from something it's non existent but because it appears it's called mithya or illusion so last week we saw that if even if we take this entire cosmos of 14 worlds all kinds of beings humans animals plants sentient insentient all the names and forms that we experience right some we don't experience some are different realms but everything that we experience we feel it's so incredibly real but what swami vidyaranya ji says okay take in verse 97 he says take this entire brahmanda the womb of brahma take this entire brahmanda and differentiate it from sat remove sat from it and what happens is it's a sat remove existence from the entire world and the world ceases to be ha huh? that existence is also awareness remove that existence remove awareness from the entire world it ceases to be and therefore he says this is only an appearance an appearance hmm and the example i gave you last time is you take the movie on the screen and you remove the screen from the movie what happens the movie cannot appear you remove the screen from the movie 
and the movie can't appear anymore. Hmm? So that is what he's saying. And the question comes is, but why is it still appearing? If it's not real, if the world is not real, why is it still appearing? And he says, let it appear. Does it matter if it appears or it doesn't? And very, very beautifully, there's an example here that the water of the mirage does not soak the earth. So also the unreal world does not disturb the oneness with reality. Hmm? So if whether the world appears or doesn't appear, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter because it doesn't do anything to reality. Whether the movie appears or doesn't appear on the screen, it doesn't do anything to the screen. Hmm? So what are we to do with this knowledge? He says then in verse 98, which we saw, make a deep impression about it. Make a deep impression that everything exists in existence. Hmm? And that existence is you. Make a deep impression. Atyanta vasate. And then what happens is that understanding will never be subverted, never be negated. So much so that even if we experience something, the knowledge always overrides that experience. So even if our daily experience is that the earth is steady, we feel the earth is steady, right? I'm walking on stable ground, but actually the earth is moving, isn't it? It's rotating, yeah? Mm -hmm. And even if our knowledge is we see the sun rise and the sun set, actually the earth is moving around the sun and that's why there appears to be this movement. And even if we see the sky that uh, it appears blue, but doesn't actually have a color, right? So even if we continue to experience things, the knowledge overrides the experience. So he says, be strong in this. And then what happens to a realized being? What happens to a realized being? What is their life like? So we saw in verse 99 that sat advaita pritang bhute. When the, that being has understood that if you remove existence from the world, it ceases to be, then that in, in the world is just an appearance, the world will go on like it did before. And it's completely okay. But that artha kriya. Artha kriya means the objects and their functionality will be the same. And it's it's fine. There's no there's no there's no reason for it to change because all of this is a transactional reality. And we spoke of three degrees of reality last time. So transactional reality will continue. Then there was a question last week, which I wanted to just also bring up about duties, right? So we feel like, okay, we're getting to that understanding, but we have so many duties, so many responsibilities, and so many roles to play. So what do we do? How does a wise person or enlightened being respond or relate to this? So it is true that in the Shastra, for an enlightened being, the Shastra gives them that freedom, that you can live as your natural whatever your natural tendency is, you can live. If you want to be in solitude, you can be in solitude. If you want to be in the world, you can be in the world. But having said this, even the enlightened being feels that if they are taking anything from the world, they will also give. So many times we will find them sharing knowledge, speaking to people, comforting people, helping people. And in fact, they, they do more above and beyond, much more than we would do, you know? Because imagine um, how Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi Ji lived. People would come see him all the time, all the time, right? And even with Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, even with Swami Tapuvan Maharaj, yes, they would have their time to themselves. But every time that people would come to them, they would give. So this, this action of giving to the world, it never goes away. But the difference is the wise or enlightened beings, they don't see it as a duty. They don't see this as a burden. They see it as an expression of their love and compassion for the world. 
So, so it could be anything. Some of them are running ashrams. Some of them are into social work. It could be anything, but there's a lightness about that. There's a lightness about that. So they don't feel bound by this duty. Many times we feel bound by the duty that, oh, I have to do this and I have to do that. There's a lightness about it. And they see it definitely as a role, like how we saw in Viveka Chudamani, right? That this, how a realized being is like an actor in a, in a show. So they're very much aware that they're playing a part. They're not owning up the part, they're playing the part. And that's the difference between us and them, right? Because with them, because they're playing a part, they know that it's just something that has to be done and they can very much let go and be at ease with it. But for us, we own that part. And we say, no, this is who I am. And this is what I do. And everything has to be a certain way. And if it doesn't, then, then you know, it's not going to work. So this is the difference. They're still in and through the world, but at the same time, beyond it. Mm -hmm. So now we continue from today. We are on verse 100. Sankhya kana da bodha dhyayi. Sankhya kana da bodhya dhyayi. Jagad bhedo yatha yatha. Jagad bhedo yatha yatha. Utprekshyate neka yuktya. Utprekshyate neka yuktya. Bhavat vesha tatha tatha. Bhavat vesha tatha tatha. Sankhya kana da bodhya dhyayi. Jagad bhedo yatha yatha. Utprekshyate neka yuktya. Bhavat vesha tatha tatha. So what he's saying here now is, in other schools, they still take the world to be real. They still take the world to be real. And we have no quarrel with that. So what are these other schools? Sankhya. Sankhya is one of the darshanas. Kanada. Kanada is Vaisheshika because it was founded by Kanada Rishi. So that's Vaisheshika. Bodha. Bodha. Some schools in Buddhism take the world to be real. And he says, Jagad Bhedaha means Jagad Bhedaha. They take the world to be other. There's duality. So there's the truth and then there's the world. There's duality. Yatha Yatha, just as they postulated this way, Uprekshate. Prekshate means they postulated this way. Aneka Yuktya, with so many various uh, forms of logic. Bhavatu, let it be. Bhavatu esha tatha Let all of this be. It's absolutely okay. So here, the followers of Sankhya, Vaisheshika, the Buddhist and other schools have established with quite an array of arguments the multiplicity in the universe. Let them have these. We have no quarrel with them. So how is the world now being viewed by different people? Uh, darshanas or different thought processes. So today we're just going to look at it from an overall perspective, right? Overall perspective. The first thing is that when we look at the world, right? We look at the world, we experience it. We find it so incredibly real. This is a computer. This is a chair. This is a table. This is an apartment. And when we think about this world, there has to be some something that created it, something that brought it here. It couldn't have just come. It must have come from something. Because everything we see comes from something. Anything that's created comes from a creator, something. A phone came from somebody who created the phone. And that something is a sentient entity. A sentient entity. It's a sentient being, right? So anybody, have we ever seen at any time somebody create something that's insentient, right? Have we ever seen a computer create a, a conscious, the, a conscious being with a first-hand experience of their, themselves? Or have we ever seen a pot create a human being? Or a, 
a, a television create an animal, a live animal. We've never seen these things in the world. What we've actually seen is that a creator, there's a sentient being. Be, be it an animal, a, a bird is creating its nest, right? An ant is creating a pile of sugar. Be it an animal or be it a human, we always find that this creator, whoever is creating, is sentient, sentient entity. And we also find that whoever is creating, they know about what they're creating. So a bird knows how to make its nest. It has the knowledge and at the same time, ability. It's able to create it. A silkworm uh, has knowledge how to create silk, how to take silk out of itself. And at the same time, it has that ability. A spider knows how to create the web and it has that ability, right? So the creator has the knowledge and ability. So this creator who has the knowledge and ability to create, this is called nimitta karana. Nimitta karana. Nimitta means it is able to affect a creation, right? We call it efficient cause. Nimitta karana in English is efficient cause. Why? Because it can affect creation. It can make creation happen. So a sentient being is required to make creation happen. This is the first point that we come to, right? So now with this first point, this dispels already uh, this belief that there's a big bang. If there's a big bang, it's a theory, but in this theory, again, how can something inert create something conscious? How can this explosion of gas, uh, you know, create all of these sentient beings, you and me, the singularity which explodes, right? And explodes into space and time and, and all the planets and all the beings. How can that singularity create you and me? Hmm? So this point now is refuted because we understand that there has to be a sentient creator, a nimittakar, what we call. Now the question is, now the next question is, how does this sentient creator create? How does this sentient creator create? Is, it, uh, the, is there another material there? Is there another material from which this creator makes things? And if there is another material, then, the creator is limited, right? Because there's something other than the creator. <laughs> so it's not another material, but the creator is now creating out of himself or herself, whoever, creating out of himself. Because if there was something else there, that would limit the creator. And the creator wouldn't be infinite. Uh, and this world we see is infinite. So then now the question comes, now, how did that creation happen? How did it happen? So did it happen in such a way? So, so actually one more point I have to uh, bring up. Because the material is of the creator itself, that's called upadana karana, means material cause. Hmm? So the material is the creator itself. The creator is creating out of himself herself, right? Upadana karana. Okay. So now this, this, the, these two things uh, just give us an overview that the creator has to be the efficient cause, the one that is sentient and affects the world. And at the same time, the material cause, the one that is the one who, from whom the material comes. That is, that is called creator, efficient cause and material cause. In Sanskrit, we say, Abhinna nimitta upadana karana. Hmm? Okay, so this is the creator. Now, what happens? Now, how did, did, did that creator become the world? Did that creator become the world? Huh? So you have this creator, this creator become this entire world. We say, no, it's not like that. So it's not like milk becomes curd, the entire creator doesn't become the world. Why? Because if the creator became the world, then where's the creator now? <laughs> Gone, <laughs> right? The milk became curd and there's no more, the milk is not there anymore. Or the milk became curd and the milk transformed. So if the creator became the world, then the creator would have transformed. 
And if the creator goes through modification, then the, the, the last modification is destruction, right? For example, I am creating. I'm creating speech now. So what's happening is there's, uh, there's heat in my body. There's heat in my body. If I go out to exercise, I'm creating movement. There's going to be sweat, right? If I am uh, writing something, I'm creating thoughts. There's going to be movement in my mind. So with one who creates, if, if they themselves become this world, they will go through all kinds of modification, all kinds of modification. And eventually, if anything undergoes any modification, it will eventually lead to destruction. That will, that's the last modification. That's a series. So we say that the creator cannot become the world, that that is now out. The second is, what if a part of the creator became the world? What if, let's say this is the creator, 100%, 20% became the world? What would happen? The first thing is the creator would not be infinite anymore. Why? Because the creator is 100% and then 20% is, is becoming the world, right? So the creator loses their infinity when you take the part of, to be the world. And then the second point in this is that uh, the creator loses its infinity and what happens in one part affects the other part, right? So, you know, if something happens in your arm and you go to the doctor and you say, something happened to my arm, the doctor will say, no, no, it's not just your arm, it's your shoulder, it's your hip, it's your stomach. <laughs> so one part affects the entire whole. So now, why would the pursuit of life B, for a creator that is subject to modification or for a creator that is finite, that has parts, why would the pursuit of life be to seek that truth or to seek that God who is finite, who is limited by these logics? Huh? I'm saying by these logics. So then the question comes, then how? How did this creation happen? How did it all appear? So then Advaita Vedanta comes and says, look, it is not how, yes, for Sankhya, Sankhya might think, yes, there is Prakriti and Purusha, and there are two realities, and when they come together, then that is the making of the world, right? So again, this is limiting God. There is Prakriti and there is Purusha. Both have the same degree of reality. Again, that's limiting that infinity. And then if you take the Vaisheshika, they say the world is real and God is also real. Again, that's limiting that reality, limiting it. So anytime we take something else to be real and God also to be real, you're limiting God. You're limiting God, right? So then what is that unlimited and infinite God? What is that? So Advaita Vedanta says that this world is appearing in God. It's called Vivarta Vada. Vivarta means without changing, the whole world appears, that the world appears from that truth. So from that truth, from that awareness, the whole entire world appears and that whole entire world dissolves into that awareness, existence, without it changing at all. Can you give an example? Example is like dream. What happens in dream? In dream, that mind huh, does not become, actually become the dream. The mind does not actually become the dream. And a part of the mind doesn't actually become the dream. But the entire mind appears as a dream. That one entire mind appears as many. That one entire mind appears as sentient and insentient beings. That one entire mind appears as all the names and forms. It appears from that mind, dissolves into that mind. That is called manifestation. In the individual standpoint. 
So from the cosmic standpoint, what's happening is from this existence in consciousness, the world is appearing and into this existence consciousness, the world dissolves. Hmm? And in this way, what happens is there is only one reality. There's only one God and that God is infinite. And the essence of that, that God is existence and consciousness. And the world then is an appearance. It is just appearing. Hmm? And this is the reality that Swami Vidyaranya Ji wants to bring to our hearts. He's saying, take a look at this. Take a look at this and think deeply about it. If the world was really real, then, then there would be two. Uh, it would limit God. It would limit God. There's the world and there's God. If the world was really real, then try to experience it without awareness. Have we ever experienced the world without awareness, without existence? And if the world was really real, then how is it that enlightened beings have actualized its unreality and are able to completely withdraw from it? How? So when we take all of this into account, all the different philosophies, just thinking clearly, we understand that it is an appearance. It is an appearance in awareness. It will appear, it will continue to appear, but it appears in awareness. And that's what we mean by illusion. That's what we mean by mithya. That's what we mean by maya. It appears in awareness. It appears in existence. So he says here that if they see that this world is different and God is different, if they believe the world to be real, then it's okay. It's absolutely okay if they believe the world to be real. Mm -hmm. But from the standpoint of Advaita Vedanta, it is an appearance. One more beautiful thing is that, you know, often, so, and this is our meaning of God. Huh? This is our meaning of God, that existence, consciousness, this is the meaning of God. People often ask, you know, if God created everything, who created God? And our answer to that is God is existence. Is there anything that exists apart from existence? It's only non-existence. And non-existence cannot create existence. And therefore, the answer to who created God, God alone is. That's our answer. Because God is existence. So anything else is non-existence. And non-existence cannot create existence. Non-existence is not there. So when we say God in Advaita Vedanta, the essential meaning is this existence consciousness, bliss. Hmm? That's how the world comes about. Okay, so let other people think that it's real. And the, so if, if, now the question comes, the poor Vakraksha comes, that if you let, let it be, you're okay with other people thinking the world to be real. Are you accepting their standpoint? Does it mean that Advaita Vedanta accepts their standpoint? So now this verse is uh, an answer to that question. 101. Avagnyatam sadadvaitam Avagnyatam sadadvaitam Nishankeran yavadivihi Nishankeranyavadivihivam so here it says, Anyavadibihi. 
Anyavadibhi means other philosophers. Uh, other philosophers. What happens? Nishankehi sadadvaitam avagnyanatam. It means that without a doubt, they avagnyanata means they disregard non duality. So other philosophers, without a doubt, they disregard that sat, that existence, that non dual existence, they disregard it. And in this way, kakshatihi means that what, what is the loss there for us? Asmakam tadvaitam avajanatam. Asmakam means for the non dualist, they disregard duality. Hmm? So they're philosophers who holding an opposite view, they disregard non-dual, the non-dual entity, but that doesn't harm us, who following the Veda, reason and experience are convinced of our own unshakable position and have no regard for their conclusion. Now, what does this mean? So many times that there is a, you know, people are against uh, uh, Advaita Vedanta because you're saying the world is not real and how can it not be real and, and all kinds of questions will be there and so how is what is Advaita Vedanta's position to that in the final say Advaita Vedanta says it is an illusion huh? it is an illusion and from even a higher standpoint Ajata, Ajata Vada it's not there huh? that's a really really high standpoint but from a certain standpoint, it's an illusion. But in the way, if people want to accept Dvaita, if people want to accept duality, if people want to accept the reality of the world, Advaita has absolutely no problem. No problem whatsoever. Hmm? And that's the reason why Advaita Vedanta is so accommodating. Because it says that people will come from all religions, all backgrounds, all cultures. And as long as they're holding on to something that can help them evolve, that's okay. So Advaita Vedanta will not have any conflict with them. Some religions will have conflict with each other. The, this only my God exists, not your God. My God is the only reality. And even within Hinduism, there is that. Only Vishnu is the only reality. Shiva is only the, the reality. Or in some religions will say, the my path alone is the path and other paths are, you know, they're, they're not valid. They're just not valid. You have to follow my path. Or some will say that if you don't follow my path, you will burn in hell. <laughs> so there's so many, many uh, contradictions there if we just look at all of them. And it's like this, this in, in Mandukya, Gaudapada Ji gives this beautiful example. So what is Advaita concerned with, right? There's a rope, there's a rope, right? And on the rope, it could be a garland that's appearing. It could be a snake that's appearing or a crack in the earth. So there's a rope there, someone sees a crack in the earth. Someone sees a snake, someone sees a garland. But the Advaita knows underneath it all is only rope. So in the same way, some believe this, this is the only path. Others believe that's the only path. Other, others believe that's the only path. It's like the garland and the crack on the earth and, and the snake. Uh, all of it is that only at that transactional level. In the level of the rope, there is harmony of everything. Hmm? Because there's only that one truth. And that one truth is so beautiful because it sees everything as a path. If, if this is your path, okay. If that's your path, okay. As long as it helps one evolve, as long as it helps one grow, it helps one evolve, become a better person and contribute to society and reach out and help other people, fine, follow that path. There's absolutely no problem. So every other religion, every other path, every other culture coexisting, no problem. But yes, at the final, Advaita firmly roots itself in the non-dual truth. So it accommodates everybody and everything. But finally, it accepts, at the final level, it accepts the non-dual truth. And that's what it's rooted in. Mm -hmm. And there's this uh, very nice verse in uh, Mandukya Upanishad, 
what happens in Vaitatya Prakarana, the second part. There are so many different uh, ways that people think creation to be. So some think that creation is, you know, the play of the gunas, like in Sankhya. Or some people believe it's uh, paramanus, or these like particles, these particles. Some people believe that it's only the mind that uh, creation is. And here, this is in Karika number 29, it says, Yam bhavam darshayed yasya tam bhavam satupashyati. It means that whatever one has grown up learning, you know, yam bhavam, bhavam means that that kind of belief, that kind of faith, that kind of culture, religion that one has grown up with, either they learned it at their uh, church or their temple or their mosque or from their parents, that bhavam, that faith, they, that's what they will see. That's what they will see and that's what they will hold on to. Tamcha avati sa bhutva aso tadgraha sam upaititam. It means that they feel also that that protects them. So that particular faith, that particular tradition, they feel that it protects them. And at the end of the day, that's what they want to attain. And that is completely okay. That is completely okay. Because as uh, Advaita Vedanta says, if it helps them grow, it helps them grow. But uh, Vedanta says, eventually one should come to the substratum of the entire thing, which is that Brahman. Hmm? So in this way, there is absolutely no problem. It's all accommodative, but in act, in the final acceptance, it is a non-dual truth. <clears throat> so then now what happens? What happens when this, this truth is very firm in one's mind? This is what he's going to say. Verse 102. Dvaita vajna sustitha chet. Dvaita vajna sustitha chet, advaite dhisthera bhavet, advaite dhisthera bhavet, sthairye tasya pumane shaha, sthairye tasya pumane shaha, jivan mukta itiryate, jivan mukta itiryate. Dvaita vajna sustita chet, advaite dhisthera bhavet, sthairye tasya pumane shaha, jivan mukta itiryate. So what does it say here? It says, dvaita avagnya sustita chet. Chet, when or if dvaita. Dvaita avagnya means there is a disregard of duality. Means when one understands the falsity of duality. And sustita means it's very, very firm. Advaite dhisthira bhavet. And when in the intellect that non dual truth is very, very firm, sthairye tasyaha means in that intellect, tasya, in that intellect, that steadiness, that steadiness, that person who has that steadiness of intellect, esha jivan mukta itiriyate. This person is called jivan mukta. So when the intellect disregards all the notions of duality, considering it to be false, it becomes firmly established in non-duality, and the one who's firmly rooted in this conviction of non-duality is called Jivan Mokta. Hmm? So very often we say, what is the definition of Jivan Mukta and who is this Jivan Mukta? So this is very much in line with Brahma Satyam Jagan Mithya. You know, so Adi Shankaracharya Ji said, I, I'll tell you all of the, the essence of all the entire scriptures in a, a verse, not even a verse, half a verse. <laughs> and he says, Brahma Satyam Jagan Mithya Jivo Brahmaeva Naparaha means Brahma Satyam. Brahman is the only truth. 
Jagan Mithya, the world is false. So these two things in chapter two, they make it very, very clear. And Jiva is Brahma, not Aparaha, not different from Brahma. So what happens here? The, this Jivan Mukta, Jivan Mukta means one who's liberated while living, very, very rooted in that duality is just an appearance. Means even if they, what is very, very rooted, what does Sustita mean? Sustita means that it's ever present, it's ever there. There's no lack, there's no time where they will think, oh my gosh, this is so real. It's like when you're watching a movie, right? Sometimes we get carried away when we're watching a movie. We get so carried away and we want to um, hurt somebody or scream or cry and we get so carried away. But there are also those who watch the movie in and throughout and they say, ah, it's just a movie. Let's just enjoy it. Whether they're crying, laughing, this happens, that happens, it's just a movie. So the same way this Jivan Mukta never forgets that this world it's just a, an appearance that this duality is a falsity. Even in their dream, even the wildest dreams, they will never ever take the world to be real. Hmm? They always know truly in their hearts that it's appearing in existence, in awareness. And the Advaita and the non-dual truth is very firm where in the Dhi, in the intellect, in the intellect. So let's not forget, right? This ignorance, where is it expressing? Ignorance is expressing in the intellect. And therefore, knowledge takes place in the intellect. There's no ignorance in Brahman. Brahman is not ignorant, right? So in the dhi, in the intellect, that ignorance that was there is now removed and knowledge has taken place. So it's called avarna bhanga. Avarna bhanga means that, that notion of I am this limited being and the world is real, this notion is broken. And it's not just broken, but it's deeply broken. And now do you remember, there, was a, there were a few verses earlier and uh, the Swami Vidya Ranyaji said, if this knowledge is not deep, what is the problem? The problem is there is doubt, samshaya, or there is anekagriya. There's a distracted mind. So when we say something is firm, it means there is no doubt about it. There is no doubt that I am that non-dual truth. There is no doubt that the world is an appearance and awareness and existence. There's absolutely no doubt whatsoever, not even a hairline fraction doubt. Huh? Because even if there's a little bit of doubt, that we have to remove. So no doubt in these two regards. And the second thing is, anekagriya, the mind must be very, very deeply into it. Huh? It can't be, I, the mind, it, it, why we're not becoming firm? Because maybe the mind is going everywhere here and there. And, the, you know, I just want to bring up this point that uh, we were discussing in the Bhagavad Gita on, in the Monday class. You know, Arjuna has this question that, I want to gain knowledge. I want to gain this, this, this realization. Can I do it through karma yoga or do I have to take karma sannyasa? Do I have to withdraw from the world? And Sri Krishna's answer is, you take the path of karma yoga, Arjuna, because your, your mind is in, in that state where it has a lot of vasanas yet. So you take the path of karma yoga. But eventually one also has to withdraw. Huh? Eventually, one has to withdraw. Now, how much time, when, and all of that depends on the purity of one's mind. But one does have to let go of everything to get deeply rooted in it. It may just even be for a few days for some people. It may be for a week or, or two. It may be a month. Uh, I remember when I was reading Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsaji's book, he said, three days. Takes three days. Just give your heart and soul to it. And you can take three days. And I was like, Yeah, I want to do it in three days. <laughs> in three days. But it's you know, it's all next to impossible, right? Someone's mind has to be so so pure. So this firmness happens. Number one, when we are 
free of doubts, which can happen, free of doubts can happen in vichara, in mananam, in thinking, in discussion, in our own reflection, in reading, this can happen. But this ekagra, you know, removing anekagra, removing distractions and just being focused on it, that can happen in contemplation. That can happen in contemplation. And for that, one does need to be uh, away. And what's really helpful is if we're away for some time every day, that's very helpful, you know? Even in the morning, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it is, every morning we sit there and we just bring that to mind and just sit with it, let it settle in us, let it settle in us so deeply that it cannot unsettle. That is called knowledge. That is called knowledge. That's something that has gone very deep. Mm -hmm. Not something that is just superficial. Mm -hmm. And so he says, then that being now is called Jivan Mukta. That being is called Jivan Mukta. Right? So there's so many definitions for Jivan Mukta. But uh, here, this is a very beautiful definition the one who's firmly, firmly rooted in knowledge. And as I mentioned before, Jivan Mukta can be seen in chapter two of the Bhagavad Gita. This, this Jivan Mukta is also Sthita Pragnya. Sthita Pragnya, one is rooted in knowledge. Or in chapter 14, Gunatita, beyond all the gunas. Or in chapter 12 also, Bhagavad Bhakta, the true devotee of the Lord. Hmm? So now, what happens to this Jivan Mukta? What happens towards the end of their life? That we will see next week. Mm -hmm. So for today, just sort of keep bringing these things to the mind and see where the doubts are. I think the first step is to see exactly where the doubts are. And if we can cut through those doubts, that's very that that's a great great step to ultimate clarity, and then slowly slowly the mind can settle in it. Mm -hmm. So we'll say the closing prayer, and then we'll see if anyone has questions. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamada Ya Purnameva Vishishyate. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Gurudev Namaha Hari Om